Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another Brandon Hall Group webinar. Our webinar today is The Power of Perspective, featuring Lisa Bodell. Lisa is the CEO of FutureThink, an award-winning company that enables organizations to kill complexity, create space for innovation, and get to the work that really matters. Lisa is one of the top 50 most popular keynote speakers in the world, and in a typical year, she brings her message to over 30 countries, so we're honored to have her today. Lisa believes that operating with simplicity will be the number one competitive advantage for organizations in the future because it allows us to focus and do more valuable things. Her company, FutureThink, uses radically simple techniques to help teams kill complexity, increase their capability for innovation, and do more meaningful work. Lisa has a great presentation, a lot of interactivity. Before we turn it over to her, though, we have some, some announcements and logistics. So first of all is to thank our webinar sponsor today, Open Sesame. They're a leading provider of online business training. Uh, they're the choice for L&D professionals wanting to drive learning initiatives forward with innovation, agility, and care. Open Sesame offers the world's most comprehensive digital learning catalog and with regularly updated content from expert, expert publishers in a variety of formats and languages. By providing comprehensive learning resources and innovative tools like Simon, the company empowers L&D professionals to exceed their goals and champion learning across their entire organization. And for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with Brandon Hall Group, on the next slide, we're a human capital management research and advisory firm that empowers excellence in organizations around the world with our research and our tools. We have six practice areas, including learning and development, talent management, and leadership development. The others are listed on the slide there. Quick mention too, we have certification programs and they're open for enrollment now, including a certified learning strategies program, a leadership development certified strategies and a certified, certified strategies program in DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can visit uh, certification.brandonhall.com to learn more about how to earn that designation. Moving to the next slide, we always like to remind folks about our research surveys. We are a research and analyst firm. So the surveys are one of the most crucial components of our insights and thought leadership. So if you have a few minutes to spare and see any topics that you can take a survey for, it would be greatly appreciated. You can see here we have one on leadership development that's open now, talent acquisition, and future ready HR. Uh, links will be available in your handout, or you can always just visit brandonhall.com. All participants receive a complimentary piece of research, the actual report from the research once the results are analyzed. And finally, a few logistics. To ask questions, please use the questions panel on your control bar. We will leave time at the end for questions. I think uh, Lisa is also going to give you a chance to answer questions versus another device, so we can uh, collect them in two different ways. The webinar is being recorded. We'll share a link to the recording and a PDF of the presentation via email in about 24 hours or less. If you'd like to download a copy of today's presentation instantly, the link to do so will be available in the chat momentarily. Chat's also open for today, and we really hope you'll share your thoughts and experiences as we go along. Really love to hear your feedback, any perspective that you have that we might be able to share along the way or toward the end of the presentation. So please feel free to join in today's discussion, throw in your comments, or just uh, hop on for a minute, tell us where you're from today. We'd love to hear from you. So let's get let's get to it. Um, Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you uh, for being here and welcome. Wonderful, Claude, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that's joining us. I know people are still rolling on here, but I am so excited to talk to you about this topic that I think is very important to people and it's the power of perspective. And what I mean by perspective, actually, most people think in terms of feedback and that is what it's about. But perspective is about how do we get uh, information how do we get insights? How do we actually unlock more potential by widening our aperture and being open to fresh thinking that might be different than ours? So when you go through today, I'm gonna to be asking us to interact a little bit. I'm gonna be asking you to reflect a little bit. So having a pen and paper nearby or somewhere to type is a good idea. So you can really reflect on how good are you at uh, getting perspective and giving perspective every day. So. One thing that I wanna first start off with is defining what do we mean by perspective? And what I mean by that is seeing 
uh, things from another person's point of view and considering different outlooks, outcomes, and possibilities as a result. I think one thing that we do is we have the benefit of experience to give us perspective, but that can be good and that can actually uh, create a trap for us as well. Um, a lot of times we color our perspective because we lack time to seek perspective and um, we lack, I guess, a, an empathy for how others do things that actually could benefit us. And I'm going to tell you a personal story to get us started by what I mean by that. Uh, this, this is a picture of my kids. This is a long time ago because they are grown and flown. But this is Jack and this is Kai and they are amazing. And we are a big adventure travel family. My kids have been to over 50 countries. And I share this because I think it's important, especially as Americans, to get out and see the world. And one of the best ways to get perspective is to participate in different cultures. And I remember the first time that I took my son on a trip and um, I was working in Spain uh, with a pharmaceutical company and my son said he wanted to come along. And he was nervous because while he takes Spanish in school and can speak a little bit, he was worried that he would be, um, that he would feel uncomfortable. And I told him that it was great to feel uncomfortable, right? That's how, you get comfortable with change. Well, what was interesting to me when I took him on this trip was I noticed that with every new meal we had, every new cultural experience, every new person we met, everything, uh, location he went to, he would occasionally have a look on his face and pull me aside and say, hey, mom, that's weird. And I remember pausing and looking at my son and saying, you know what, Jack, Believe it or not, when the people you're interacting with see you do things, they think you're weird. And I remember him saying, you know, pausing for a minute and then thinking, no, <laughs> I don't do things weird. And I said, well, you can't use the word weird when you're with mom. When you travel with mom, I want you to use the word different. And what was so interesting about that was from now on on that trip and every other one, his perspective completely changed because weird, right? When we're not familiar with it, that sets up a construct of right and wrong. Different sets up a, con a concept of new ways and new perspectives. So that's a big thing for us today is how can we be different in our approach? So let's talk today about these three things. First of all, why is getting feedback and perspective so important? What is holding you back, me back? from having more perspective? And finally, how? And that's the most important. Can you start to get better perspectives consistently, not just when you want confirmation? All right, let's dive in. And again, if you have questions, welcome for you to put them in the chat, but we will have a chance at the end for an AMA and ask me anything. So there is an imperative around perspectives. And the reason this is important is because executives are very aware that their business models are in total jeopardy. Now, this is a statistic it's only gotten more from before COVID, right? It took a pandemic for people to really have their eyes opened up that there is the possibility of real total disruption. I mean, think about it. It's like being a car company, an automotive business, and saying that EVs aren't going to go anywhere. It's like being um, a real estate company and all of a sudden getting hit with remote work. Having perspective teaches you possibilities and potential, and it keeps you open to change. So you're not on the defense, but you're on the offense. The problem right now around perspective is we all know that things could be disrupted, not just through tech, but by missing, having a blind spot. We also know that um, innovation is important and we know our ability to survive and be successful depends on it, right? You can't, you can't stand in the middle of the road the whole time. The problem is this, we know that, but we have no structures in place. We have no process in most companies for capturing ideas that are across or outside our organization. I mean, I'd like you to think about this for yourself. What are the ways right now that you capture perspective in your daily work? Well, what I want to do is I want to get to know your thoughts on perspective. So do me a favor, and I'd love it uh, with a device you have nearby, ideally on your phone. 
do me a favor and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and enter in this code. And that code is 9184052. Again, go to menti.com, and I want you to enter in the code 9184052. Now, this URL and this code will be on the top of slides going forward. So if you get kicked out, you can easily get back on. All right, so let's start to interact using this site. I would love to know from each of you, thinking about your team or your organization, how good is your organization at getting fresh perspectives when you're trying to make a decision or do something new? How good? The answers are not good, okay, good, or great. How good is your organization at getting fresh perspectives? Now, as these are rolling in, I'll tell you, I ask this question a lot. And when you look at the, the direction here, the themes, uh, and I think you're seeing a theme, my reaction is, congratulations, you're like everyone else. Right? We have a couple people that said great, and that's amazing. I think you're still going to get some new ideas around that. But for the rest of us, there's some areas for improvement. Most organizations have um, a few good people or role models that are good at getting perspectives, or they have pockets that are good at getting perspectives. And what I mean by that is the innovation team, the strategy team, the creative team, the R&D team. But rarely across the organization are there structures in place. Okay, let me keep going forward and ask another question. What would be the biggest impact of getting more fresh perspectives at work? And you can give me, I think you have the opportunity to give me a few answers. What would be the biggest impact of getting fresh perspectives at work? Let's see what people have to say. Interesting. Compassion. Oh my gosh, that's a great one. Ideas, insight, diversity, diversity, engagement, buy-in, empathy, learning, difference, ownership, educating. This is great. Really great. Connectivity, relevancy. Engagement, more engagement. So not surprisingly, innovation is the top thing that people say. That's the biggest impact is that we can actually learn new things, but it's not just about new. Getting perspectives actually does, um, it creates that human connection. I was just on the phone before this with a, a pharmaceutical company I'm on a board of, and we were talking about um, what is the power of perspective and empathy is a big thing that comes up getting more human at work. And if we can understand different perspectives, we can be more respectful, I think, of people's opinions. Well, what's interesting about this is the answers you're correct in all this feedback. The ongoing power of perspective is bigger than just feedbacking. It's this, you get better decision-making, right? Because you can challenge your biases. That's the biggest one. Perspectives challenge your biases. You don't know what you don't know. The other thing is better problem solving. It's an increase in better ideas, fresh ideas. You also decrease your risk. And then finally, and probably most importantly for the people here, it gives you a competitive advantage. Again, you're going to find out knowing what you don't know. The compelling thing that really gets executives is that diversity, and this is not just a diversity discussion, but diverse thinking gets better results. That's why we want to have diverse teams. That's why we want to have diverse thinking styles. And that's why we want to engage the unusual suspects. You will get better financial results if you seek out perspectives, right? You minimize risk, you get higher return on equity. You have a culture that's more likely to challenge each other. We all talk about challenging the status quo, but I don't think, I think people have a lot of fear. We need to have people that are curious and being able to get perspectives creates a curious culture. 
And the other thing is impact. You know, a greater proportion of revenue from a curious or challenging the status quo culture comes from innovation. And I don't just mean incremental, I mean radical. So there's a lot of benefit financially and culturally in doing this. So I want to ask you, let's go back to your phones and go back to current slide. It's probably going to give you that prompt. So what is stopping you from getting more diverse perspectives within your company? What's the issue that you're experiencing, at least for the people that said they weren't good at it? Um, and how am I going to help you overcome that today? Okay, what's holding you back? Okay, so let's see what we have here. We have mm -hmm, time. I think time actually is one of the biggest. Remember, most of us are spending time, not investing time. And there's a big difference between the two. Size of the firm, trust, safety. Very good, guys. Hierarchy, politics, access. Thinking about it, right? So another thing is we're just, we're so, again, executing our calendars. We are very task oriented that taking the time to get perspective almost seems, it seems like a lot. Okay, so of these responses, again, this is common. What I wanna do is help you get over the hurdle and have you start to reflect on um, your ability to be open to get perspectives in the first place. So go ahead, keep responding, but I'll move on, even though in the background, it'll capture your responses if you answer. So here's the thing, this is a very human problem. And I mean that in a good way, right? We are um, evolutionarily, we are wired to seek the known. And what that means when we're trying to solve a problem, we tend to go to the default. Um, of what our experience has taught us and um, and what's safe. So what's interesting about this is when you think about wired to seek the known, what does that mean? What it means is this, first of all, like just from a, a Cro-Magnon perspective, right? When you look back in terms of cavemen, if you want to get really down to it, we are wired to assess threat, right? That is the, we go right into our, um, our brain stem and we look at from our limbic system, what is a threat emotionally? And we want to avoid it, right? We want to have stasis. But the issue there is by avoiding things, we don't seek out different. The other thing is we default to the known because that is um, safer and we trust it more. Defaulting to the known um, is basically a confirmation bias. The other thing that's happened now, especially with technology and data, 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 is we spend a lot of time trying to filter out the noise. And it's hard for us to know signal versus noise because there's just so much. The results are, are also the influence is speed. The biggest thing for everybody, because I keep mentioning that time is the issue, um, is we need to move fast. I mean, it's interesting when you think about Darwin, at, since his time in the Galapagos and when he was writing his, his original thesis, he took 28 years to actually write his, um, his manifest around what he thought was about uh, evolution. Um, now, having 28 years to do something is just impossible. We're all about quarterly earnings. So the need for speed makes us trying to just get confirmation so we can move on, not move up. So the result of this is confirmation bias. And so when you hear about confirmation bias, it's very evolutionary that we are stuck in seeking the known, trying to filter out the noise and using our experience to say how we've done it before is probably how we should do it going forward. The result of that is um, we miss out on in innovation opportunities. So one of the things that we need to do is be able to recognize our bias, make sure that we're not just selecting information that supports our views, most importantly, we are not ignoring contrary information. What do I mean by this? When you are a leader, I want you to think about perspective because we are here to talk about how to get perspective, right? The power of perspective, but where you are affects your point of view, right? So this cartoon actually really illustrates it well. I think our perspectives shape how we react in a situation. And I want you to think about this. Think about the time. Think back when you first became a manager. 
and how your perspective on work and your team completely changed. You can even type in the chat if you want, like, how did it change for you? I mean, for me, I, I remember that moment, right, when I became a boss. And it's that moment when suddenly everyone's going out for drinks and you might not be invited anymore <laughs> because they're talking about work and gossip. And now you're part of the man, right? You're part of the, of the executives. And you act differently. And so your perspective changes. And maybe how you get and give feedback changes too. So there's a couple things that I want you to start to reflect on, okay? What could be different in your leadership if you chose to be more generous in your interpretations of perspective? And even more importantly, what could be different in your personal leadership style if you got more perspectives and were more open to getting perspectives? There's two things I want you to think about as a leader because there's two different ways to get perspectives. The first is this perspective taking. And this is what you probably think getting perspective is. You're trying to understand, empathize a situation from another's point of view. This is really where people are talking about active listening, right? You're a good leader if you are actively listening to others' perspectives. But perspective taking is reactive, right? That to me is like the basic table stakes of being a leader. And sample situations for this are things like when people voice their opinions and you listen and say, tell me more, or they voice their concerns in a one-on-one, -on -one, or you're getting a 360 review at work. The trap here is, are you really seeing it as perspective or are you looking at it as right or wrong? Are you able to really listen or are you judging? That's perspective taking, right? Taking in another's point of view in the moment, it tends to be reactive and actively listening isn't judging, but suspending a judgment to hear the other's point of view. So I want you to think about something. I want you to think about a time when someone gave you a perspective that was different than yours. Think about the last time someone gave you a a perspective that was really different than the norm. What was the situation? And what was your initial reaction or impact that it had on you? you know, for many people, one of the things you're gonna think about is politics. Um, and when someone differs than you, um, is your initial reaction emotional, right? Do you get heated about something? Do you get defensive or is it a conversation? So think about that and ask yourself the questions, did, was I really taking in the perspective or was I waiting to talk? So perspective taking is the first part, but you know what the other part is? Perspective seeking. And this is where I think organizations fall down. So the people that are here today, you probably are like, yes, I am an active listener. I am good at receiving feedback, but you're reacting to it. I also want you to be proactive about it. So perspective seeking, the good leaders take the time to seek out or better understand their point of view from different or even unusual perspectives. So this is not about active listening. This is about curiosity. So authentically hearing and learning more about another's perspective because you seeked it out on purpose. You're open, you're discovering blind spots. That's really what it is. You don't know what you don't know. Now, situations like this are, especially for senior leaders here, you know, if you have to make a difficult or unclear decision, you need to seek out feedback. Because especially as a leader, a lot of people are afraid to give you feedback. They're afraid for you to be taking in perspective. So unless you seek it out, you're not going to get it. And the other thing is around new expertise or initiative, something totally new, innovation that you're doing. Seeking out different or uncommon perspectives is really important. And I think what we want to consider here, right, I want you to really think about, think of a time at work when you sought out another point of view. When's the last time you really sought out, not in a meeting, but like actively called upon someone to get their point of view? Who did you ask and why? What was the situation? And 
was it helpful? If not, why? And if so, why? I think the thing we want to really think about is the difference between perspective taking and seeking. Are you reaching out to people that validate or challenge your point of view? Right? There's a big difference between seeking information and seeking confirmation. So it's really interesting when you start to think about the difference between these. I want you to ask yourself this. This is a reflective question for you. What are some ways that you could get more perspective to reach your business goals? And I'd love to ask you to type that in the chat if you could. So what are some ways that you currently or would like to get more perspective to reach your business goals? For a lot of us, we haven't thought about it. And we tend to think we're going to call a meeting. We're going to go online. But there are lots of ways that you could get more perspective. And I'm going to teach you how. Um, you know, one thing that I really like, um, a couple of the consulting firms that I work with in innovation, is um, they bring in uh, people to just give their teams new juice. They call them knowledge drops, KDs. And what I like about it, having a KD is bringing someone in about a topic, let's use AI, right? The topic du jour as why aren't we just bringing in somebody uh, for 15 minutes to do a quick knowledge drop during one of our status meetings? What's a way that you could get fresh perspective in a way that doesn't become onerous to people, but makes them think? And we're getting some really good ideas here that are being asked by people. Okay. I want to now share with you, now that we know that it's perspective taking and perspective seeking, that one is about active listening, the other one is about seeking, being curious. How can we start to embed that into our workday so it becomes um, common, right? We tend to do this episodically, like when we're, something's urgent or there's a big risk. How do we make it part of every day so it really embeds into the culture? By the way, it starts with you. If leaders don't do it, your teams won't do it. So I'm gonna give you four kind of hunting grounds, as I like to call it, of ways that you can embed the power of perspective into daily work. The answer of which one you're gonna use really depends on how big of a, um, a perspective seeker and taker you are and um, how important it is to your innovation goals. All right, let's dive in. We're going to, again, four buckets, and I'm going to give you some examples of techniques you can use. I am going to ask you at the end which one you're going to try. So write down the ones that turn you on. All right, the first one is I would like you to set up some advisory systems. You know, one of the reasons that I said getting perspective is episodic is because there's no systems in place. How do you create um, or assign someone to give advice in a way that's helpful, not confirming? but advising. A couple ways that I've seen that are really, really great. And if you like these, of course, type that in the chat. Um, assigning a devil's advocate. Um, I've seen this within a lot of branches of the military. I've also seen this within certain pockets of R&D teams, uh, both at manufacturing companies, pharma companies, and banks. Assigning a devil's advocate is really important because and if I have one more person tell me they have a culture of nice, um, we have cultures of nice. We are afraid to uh, give feedback because we are afraid of being dismissed. We're afraid of being fired. Fear rules a lot of companies, and that's why we don't get feedback or ask for it. Assigning a devil's advocate basically mandates, gives permission, empowers people um, to be the contrarian. And what happens when you assign a devil's advocate, it can be, usually it's a rotating thing. Uh, for example, within one manufacturing company, every month they have uh, someone who is the devil's advocate for the group. And their job is to poke holes, right? To, to uncover the blind spots. In fact, I know one group that calls them the director of blind spots. And their, their job is to literally call out what might be wrong or what might be naive or what might be um, deceiving about an idea so we can bulletproof it. So assigning a devil's advocate can be something that is really powerful and takes away the fear of feedback. Another one that I think is really, really cool 
is um, creating an advisory board. Advisory board is interesting, right? Because we talk about it, but I think having that as something that is assigned on a yearly basis is very cool. And what I mean by that is that um, we want to get people that are within, adjacent, and beyond our industry. So let me tell you what I mean. If you are um, at a retail company, you might want to have people on your board that have worked in retail. You want to have people that have worked just in customer service, or you want to have people that have nothing to do with your industry to give you adjacent or different dots to connect. So ask yourself this when we talk about having systems in place. Write down first thing that comes to your mind, and you can even type it in the chat if you're going to be so bold. What two people would you ask to be on your team's advisory board? What two people? Okay, that's interesting. Now, the question is, why would you ask those people? That's the cool part. Okay, next. I want you to think about the next bucket. And that bucket is this. I want you to engage unusual suspects. You know, we are terrible at thinking differently, not about how we're going to get feedback, but who we're going to get it from. And the reason I like unusual suspects is because the best feedback comes from the people that you didn't suspect. Let me give you some examples. So Weston Hotel did something, and this is over a decade ago when they started this, and I love it, right? They decided rather than asking people at their hotels, right, this was within Starwood, um, or, or asking customers who loved them, what they should do differently or what innovations they could create. They actually talked to the people in customer service and said, give us names of people that have called up and complained, that have stopped being part of our member program or have said, I will never stay at your crappy hotel again. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's a crappy hotel. What well, reason I'm saying that is, is we always are looking for confirmation. Why are we asking people that already love us? Let's ask for people that know what the problems are. Their best innovations come from the people that have said, we don't want to stay with you anymore. That's an unusual suspect. Okay, so one way of saying that is, how can you engage people that scare you? And who is that? When I say that, who comes to mind? All right, next one. You can do like what Accenture did. You know, it's interesting, especially within consulting companies, we talk a lot about work-life balance. We all talk about work-life balance, but especially for people that are road warriors on the road um, or kind of at the beck and call sometimes of their clients, um, they spend a lot of time away from home. And to be able to create more work-life balance, rather than just talking to employees through employee surveys, they actually brought in people's family members and they asked them, right, the adjacents, tell me the impact of work-life on your family. What ways could we work differently to create a better work-life balance? Those were interesting, interesting feedback. Okay, great stuff in the chat, by the way. Thank you, everybody. Let me tell you another one that I really like. I want to talk about HBO. HBO did something really interesting. Uh, we've worked with them in the past regarding, we do a, a technique called kill a stupid rule. And what was really interesting working with one group was we worked within their group and we said, um, let's get rid of rules that you just, that hold you back. And people love to get rid of rules. It was so successful that they started engaging people, um, other groups that they had issues working with to kill rules and processes or improve them, how they could work together. And then they actually started killing stupid rules with their clients. So they engaged their clients to have a structured conversation around how is it difficult to work with us and how is it difficult for them to work with that client to improve the relationship. So there's a lot of ways that you can get perspective around how you can work better by engaging in a structured discussion and being very candid. So let me ask you this. Type in the chat or just write down for yourself 
who would be an unusual suspect that could offer you a unique point of view, either to your team or uh, for your product? Who would be somebody that would be just off the charts odd? Sometimes the unusual suspect could be, um, it could be a child. It could be um, the competition, right? Imagine HBO bringing in someone from Netflix, right? Someone just said interns, a teenager. This is fantastic. Um, new hires. Often, you know, what's really great is how do you talk to not people that are that are leaving the company or been at the company? Talk to people who, um, yeah, employees that have left the company. That's great. Cleaner, everyone talks to the cleaners. That's great. Um, the new hires are the ones that haven't had, um, you know, they're the ones that still come in and are like, why the hell do you guys do things this way? They have a very fresh perspective that you want to get before it's beaten out of them. <laughs> okay, recent immigrant. This is great. Okay. So unusual suspects. And how do you make that part of your, uh, your feedback so you're not getting confirmation, but you're getting information? Big difference, right? All right, let's go to the next one. So that's bucket number two. We've got advisory systems. We've got unusual suspects. Here's the next one. I want you, and this is kind of fun around innovation, to seek unique collaborations. And, you know, the best innovations, and I mean beyond just incremental, the disruptors come from the dots you didn't expect to connect. We've all heard, and I put this up here because you're familiar with it, you know, McDonald's drive through is really getting their inspiration from Formula One pit crews. How can we change things, make it more efficient, make it faster? That's a very, I like to talk about within, adjacent, and beyond. That's a beyond connection. That's really cool. You got to think about, it's not just looking at someone that's completely different than yourself. There's lots of audiences or hunting grounds you can look at. Let me show you what I mean. So if you're someone like Pixar, for example, it's how do we improve what we have by tapping the expertise of others within an organization? So when you think about Pixar, right, you're hiring rock stars, like kind of like even pharmaceutical companies, you're hiring rock star scientists. But we, we want to create a collaborative environment, not a competitive environment. And what you see here are initial drawings of very famous characters within uh, Pixar movies that, you know, they, they do a a process where actually you start drawing a character and then you have to pass it around the table and everyone builds on it till it comes back. I mean, imagine if people hadn't passed around um, uh, Woody, for example, and it, it ended up like this, oh my God, rather than like this in Toy Story. Getting different perspectives allows us to improve. Maybe it's not employees, maybe it's different business units. Um, you know, 3M has set up a really great um, kind of innovation board where they have people across not just different functions, but different technologies and businesses always get together because an a, a, a technology in one group can serve another group. So here you've got um, people that were in consumer products for Band-Aids. I mean, who cares about a Band-Aid? How are you going to innovate a Band-Aid? Well, they actually looked to their hospital division and saw that their film Tegaderm film, which you guys have all used, as you can see here, like if you've ever had an IV or gone in for a procedure in a hospital, um, the Tegaderm was really great, right? Because it didn't stick too much to the skin. Um, it was waterproof and it was transparent. Using the Tegaderm technology from the hospital division, they took it over to the consumer brand of their Band-Aid division and became the number one Band-Aid brand in the world. Maybe it's customers. You know, I know we have focus groups, but I don't think we really use them. We don't listen enough. Duracell is a really good example. Duracell actually was um, was going to innovate their packaging, right? Why not innovate our packaging? Well, packaging wasn't the issue. And they figured that out when finally one rogue group within Duracell said, rather than us just trying to, I don't know, remarket our packaging, why don't we go out and actually talk to customers about what they want different in one of our most important batteries, our hearing aid batteries. So they went out in a van and they went to um, dif different assisted living facilities and nursing homes. And they actually asked people who had hearing aids to show them how they use their batteries. And what they discovered was unbelievable. What they discovered is many people um, were using um, hearing aids that where the batteries were dead. And the reason why was they couldn't see 
and they couldn't actually put a new battery into the hearing aids and they were too embarrassed to ask people for help. You know, those little hearing aid batteries are small. And what they realized was people had these huge contraptions where they were trying to actually tong, take tongs to put the little batteries into their hearing aids. What came out of this was they didn't need a package innovation, they needed an application innovation. And that's how they came up with this easy tab, which has a little magnet on the end of it. So people can actually lift the little hearing aid battery out of the case and put it into their hearing aid. They became the number one hearing aid battery because they listened to customers. Maybe it's the competition. This is one that I think people always get scared about. You know, P&G was interesting. They partnered with Clorox to come up with Glad Press and Seal. And it was a legal innovation where they wanted to have a better um, saran wrap. And actually there was a, a, a technology actually that was used in um, uh, white strips that they could apply to press and seal. And what they did is they actually created a joint venture together where they could come up with a new product using one person's technology and one person's brand to improve it and come up with a whole new distribution in the kitchen. Maybe the way you need to get perspective is talking to your vendors. I love the partnership between Toshiba and UPS. They were able to collapse the time of repair time of computers down from eight to 10 days to four days because Toshiba was having to have UPS send the package to a hub and then from the hub to Toshiba Toshiba would have their technicians fix it. They'd send it back to the hub and then UPS would ship it out. Actually, what UPS said is, why don't you just train some of our people? We'll hire technicians and we'll repair it right in the hub. And that way we cut out one of the steps and the results were pretty fantastic. More money for UPS, better customer service and outsourcing for Toshiba. And there's other little ones. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but the BMW iDrive system that came from the gaming console technology. So they looked at gamers and realized there's a much easier way to use dials, right? And still be able to look at your screen and look at the road and not have to look down. Or maybe it's hiring at a, at a, uh, a baby carriage or a um, uh, product company that, that makes, um, uh, sorry, I'm not using the right term, nursery toddler care toddler products, they hired an engineer who used to work in aviation. And they realized that the best way to make a McLaren stroller and have it fold up is similar to landing gear on a plane. Hiring different people gets you different ideas. So I'm gonna give you the last bucket and then I'm gonna actually pose a question to you and we'll open up for questions. I think the other thing is not just advisory boards and unusual suspects, and not from just looking outside, having happy accidents, but I think you got a break from routine. This is gonna be your hardest one. Here's why. You don't have time. We like the known. We like um, being able to do the same thing over and over again, because it's known. We think we're in a groove, but guys, you're really in a rut. And the problem is grooves and ruts look and feel exactly the same. Breaking from routine, if you wanna get new ideas, you gotta do something new. So how could you do that with your team? How could you shake it up so you could really ignite their brain? And it can be small things or big things. A couple examples I wanna share with you. One is Nike, and I love this. So rather than um, having set training for everybody during the year, I mean, you need to do that, right? You have your mandatory training, and then you also have your skill building, but you don't have a way to actually ignite people's brains in ways that are important and exciting to them. Nike actually gives a stipend. This is within their innovation kitchen and outside to certain designers. Um, to designers to use each year, call it like 500 bucks. I don't know what the current stipend is. Um, to take a class on something completely unrelated to work. One of the designers took an origami class, right? Japanese paper folding. And what they came up with was the City Knife shoe came out of that. This is the shoe. Um, it's actually not in production anymore, but the point is the idea. You know, when a lot of people travel, uh, this is why I have <laughs> my weight issues. You know, I travel and I don't bring my shoes with me because they take up too much space in my luggage. The City Knife shoe is a foldable shoe which still has a durable sole, but it's foldable that you can put into your suitcase and you can wear when you're on the treadmill or at least when you go to the gym. Brilliant idea because somebody 
took an origami class. Here's another one that's interesting. I think taking your team on a field trip is really important. And one that I did, and I encourage you to do, for example, you know, you can take tours of Amazon warehouses, go online, find the nearest Amazon warehouse that's offering a tour and take your people on a field trip. I wanted to know behind the scenes, how does it work? And they give formal tours. What's really cool is I think that um, by doing these things, you give new juice and new inspo to your team. You have them experience it, not just read about it. And you have them able to talk to the unusual suspects that they wouldn't have talked to otherwise. So let me ask you this. Go back to your phones for me, because we're almost at time. I want you to tell me, go to current slide, which technique are you going to try first? Which technique of all of these would you want to try first? Let us know what you think. I mean, for me, it was, I give my team a stipend and I take them on a field trip, right? So that's what somebody just said here. It's breaking from routine. Breaking from routine seems to be popular. Devil's advocate, very interesting. Devil's advocate is interesting because it, um, it takes away fear, right? It makes questioning the status quo mandatory. Unusual suspects break from routine. This is very, very interesting. Let me scroll up here and see if I can get more. Ask the target audience, very good. Ask customers that use our services, very good. Unique collaborations, learning something new not related to my job. See, what's interesting about this and this is just a few different people, right? What's interesting about it is everyone has a different approach and that's okay. The key is to try something because when you start to actually embed it into your culture, people aren't just perspective taking, but they start to be curious and are perspective seeking. They change from reactive to proactive and you take away the fear. So I hope you will try one of these. I think that would be great. Hey, it's just a final note, and then we'll leave you with some resources here. I do want to open it up, and I'm going to invite Claude back um, just for a quick AMA. We only have a few minutes, and I invite you using Menti or using the Q&A um, to submit a question. How can I help, or what thoughts do you have around getting and giving fresh perspective in your job? Getting or giving fresh perspective in your job. I think the first step, by the way, is just trying something. And I think all of you are trying something, anything, right? Trying anything. Hey, Claude. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> there, it, there is one question here, Claude, that came in that I see in the chat. Yep. I was just giving people a couple more minutes. So, yeah. So, this is an interesting question. Is there a cultural difference in people's tendencies to proactively seek perspectives? That yes. was actually in the question. Yeah. 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 Um, the answer is yes. I think it is very cultural. And I also think it's it's age, how you do it. So um, there are cultural differences. Some cultures are very hierarchical. And so asking perspective, um, you know, you, you need you need permission. And uh, sometimes it has to be more collaborative or consensus driven. So I think the way you would choose to get to seek perspective might have to be more uh, agreed upon and collaborative in some cultures versus others. Here's another question. Can you elaborate on peer influence when it comes to gaining perspective? That's interesting, peer influence. Um, it depends on what you mean by that. But I think with peer influence, what can be really interesting is, um, I guess what comes to my mind is extroverts versus introverts. And this kind of relates to cultural too, which is um, peer influence. It's usually more influenced by the leader, right? Whether you're allowed to or feel that you can get perspective. Peers can influence in that um, when you just need that one person that does it within your team, it's uh, they become kind of like a beacon for you to follow. The issue on teams becomes um, when you have somebody that's the extrovert and they are the, the loudest talker. 
I think how you want to be able to get feedback, you need to have a variety of ways. So you include not just the extroverts who are always voicing their opinions, but you get the introverts as well. That's why I use Menti in a lot of my big meetings because it gives people comfort in voicing their opinions if they happen to be quieter. Okay, a couple of the other things that are here. We just have time for a couple more. Um, seeking, how do I seek perspective from outside my organization? Um, well, I think that's one of the most important things to do because you wanna get out of, outside of your culture. <laughs> one of the biggest things or one of the biggest issues around perspective is, you know, we have pretty strong cultures within our companies. Um, and we think that the way that our company operates is quote normal. And quickly you realize when you go to another company or you talk to someone from another company, that's not true. So being able to build your network, even tapping your LinkedIn to get different perspectives can be wildly helpful. All right, let me keep looking here. Any best practices for remote work teams? Yes. Yeah. That's a good one. I think the one with remote teams, well, first of all, I just mentioned using something like Menti here. Remote teams, you need to have a structured way to get people to get um, feedback together, to collaborate and not to get consensus, but to get um, uh, get participation. So I use Menti a lot and I use other ways. I use Google Jamboards, I use other ways. So people feel heard, they feel seen and they heard, they have a channel to provide information. Another thing that is really important, I think is a leader especially when we have remote work teams, is how can we better use our, our time together with intent? So a lot of times what's happening with meetings, we say that meetings are for collaboration, but they're not. Meetings too often are just about providing information. And that's why we often say that's a meeting that could have been an email. I think for people that have remote work, I would think this. First of all, we need to think about meetings more as meetings are an opportunity for um, uh, collaborating and decision-making. Emails are for information, phones and Slack are for urgency. So when we get together with remote teams, how can we be more intentional about our time and do what a lot of other teams do, which is rather than just sending out an invite with a statement, Use the subject line of your invite or the agenda of your meeting as a question. And what I mean by that is um, when you send out a meeting notice, rather than saying Lisa's status meeting, each week I pose a question to my team that I want to focus on in that meeting. So they start thinking and I can get their perspective in advance. Sometimes our agendas will be all questions because I want them to think through what are the questions and perspectives that I need on different topics versus saying to people, does anyone have an idea? Yeah, you know, for the learning people on, on the phone, another way to look at that is kind of taking the flipped, flipped classroom approach is, is that you're not there to be talked to in the classroom. You're there to participate, solve problems. So you present the information in advance. They read it, they absorb it. They come ready to participate. And I think that's, that's basically what you're saying. But for the learning people on the call, and we usually have quite a few, that it's really the same concept and just use that for your meetings and then drive people to be talking. And then with collaborative platforms, you can also break into different breakout groups within the platform, even if you're in remote teams, and then people can brainstorm within the group, come back and share their thinking with the larger group. You know, one of the biggest issues with perspectives, and that was really smart what you just said, Claude. Um, it's hard for people to seek or take perspectives because they don't have time. And what I mean by that is they don't have time to think. Right. So we are spending so much time reacting, but it's hard to be proactive. Like thinking is a proactive activity, right? We need to have time to really, to have good ideas, we need to have time to think. And so carving that out like through breakouts is really, really important because we need to take a beat. You know, it's, it's interesting. Somebody just had typed in here, I like the term, companies using different language. So someone mentioned here, not using the term safe space, but brave space. And what I really like about that is, you know, the biggest issue around getting perspective is fear. And your job as a leader is not just to minimize friction, you know, take away problems, but minimize fear. And so one of the things I would say, like using brave space, um, 
it's not just creating the space and telling people to be brave because I, I don't know if they know what that means, by the way. What does it mean to be brave? Um, but it's modeling the behavior. So if you're a leader on this or if you're in charge of L&D, we teach this, it's if you want people to have better feedback, if you want people to take perspectives, if the leader doesn't do it, other people won't do it, right? Because it's all driven by fear. One more question here. What if people are overly protective of their decision-making authority? That is a problem. A big problem. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the biggest problem, right? It is. And so what's really interesting about that, Claude, is, um, yeah, because it's hard to see perspectives if they're going to be, they're the decider, right? Um, I think one thing about perspectives is being able to present scenarios. So ultimately, someone might have the decision, but you can at least present the information to avoid risk. That's another thing. And the other thing around decision-making authority, I, I find within organizations is we need to spend more time defining um, who has what decisions when. And if we do that, we might find that leaders are more willing to give up their decision-making authority than we think. So one thing we talk about is always using um, the context, you, me, we. So if leaders could do take more time to decide what decisions do you make, do I make, and do we make, we would have less fear around being able to get different perspectives and make decisions around innovation. You know, what and, I find in, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, Claude. What I find in talking to leaders a lot of time is they want to let others help them make decisions, but because they don't have a collaborative environment where people feel free to give ideas, they don't think there are any ideas out there. So they it's a self-perpetuating circle. Yes. Gee, I, I would like to give away some of my decision-making so I don't have to make it, but I'm not hearing from anybody. So I must make the decisions. But in most cases, they're not giving them uh, the ability or a platform or making it safe for them to contribute those ideas. So I think you're, what you're saying is great. A lot of this is driven by, we know this, right? As L and D people here, um, it's behavior, it's human behavior. A lot of it's driven by fear. So if we can uh, minimize the fear, not just the friction, if we can model the behavior, that's fantastic. And if we can set up a, a construct where people can get different ideas, different inputs, et cetera, it will make that, um, you know, getting getting different people's information less scary. I, th I think the problem with bosses and me being one, you being one, um, is that bosses tend to not ask for a lot of perspective because frankly, it creates more work. Like I just wanna move fast and I wanna move on. And uh, getting perspective takes time. So that's the fear for leaders is if I'm going to do this, I hope it's going to result in something that's productive and doesn't create more work for me. Yeah, that reminds me of a, a quick story we could wrap up on is uh, I had a client who uh, did what you suggested. Is he, he gave, he actually asked people to put thinking time on their calendar. <laughs> okay. And so, th yeah. This was a break from tradition. He usually was not very forthcoming with letting people think. So he gave them thinking time. And then he came back on another session that he was, that I was coaching with and he said, well, nobody provided me with any ideas. And I said, well, you gave them thinking time. Mm -hmm. Did you encourage them to come forward with their thoughts? <laughs> and like, well, wasn't that obvious? <laughs> but there was no, there was no atmosphere. There was not an environment where they feel safe to do that. So they were looking for an invitation that they didn't receive. I completely agree. And Claude, that's an excellent time. Carving out the time to think is really, really important. And that's where we'll want to go seek out new perspectives. So anyway, Claude, I know we're at time and I want to say thank you so much for, uh, you know, allowing me to talk to everybody today and uh, giving them the opportunity to sharpen their vision and really challenge the way that they they think. I, I hope it's been good for people and I hope that they'll um, they'll afterwards read more about it in terms of getting more perspective. Visit Open Sesame and of course, Claude, work with you. Yeah, great. This has been great, Lisa. Great participation by everybody. Thank you to Lisa and Open Sesame. Thank you to all of you for taking the time and we look forward to seeing you on another webinar very soon. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.